All roads may lead to Rome, but all historical roads lead to somewhere in Samaria if you look hard enough. Welcome to Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. From the first empire to the first collapse, there is a surprising amount of meat on the bones of this historical tale for an era which we know so little about. So let's reconstruct the dizzying amount of timelines into one relatively cohesive narrative and discover the history of Mesopotamia. Our story begins, uh, well, that's kind of the first issue right there. Given that Mesopotamian civilization is kind of the first civilization, it's not hard to see how scholars have trouble pinning down the exact where's and when's of its existence. However, through careful study, we are able to carve the early history into five relative sections. There is the pre-dynastic period, the early dynastic period, the Akkadian period, the Gutian period, and the Ur period. So let's go one by one and untangle the archaeological mess, shall we? The pre-dynastic period is the longest of the sections, but it's understandably the one which we know the least about. The period itself is trisected into three cultures, named after the place where their existence was first discovered. The Ubaid culture was first, and it's mainly notable for being insanely old. Just over 8,000 years ago, also known as 6,200 BCE if you're boring, we begin to see the evidence of the first Ubaid towns along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. However, things really got going starting around 4,500 BCE. Here lay the foundations for the Mesopotamian cultures, as the towns founded in this period would soon grow into massive urban centers, such as Eridu and Uruk. They are mainly notable for the clay pottery, which we actually have a fair amount of despite how ancient it is. As time passed, and by time I mean a casual 2,000 years, we enter the Uruk period at around 4,100 BCE. The towns founded in the Ubaid period grew to become city-states, which each controlled their own territories in the region of Sumer. However, the largest and most influential of the cities was Uruk, which we believe held some political power over the large territory encompassing multiple city-states. Here's problem number two. We don't know exactly to what extent Uruk held influence, nor how they enforced it. However, it was clear that the urbanization process which had begun around the entire region was centered around the city. This led into the final section of the pre-dynastic period, the Jemdat Nasara period. While the city of Uruk itself did not collapse, yet, its influence seemed to gradually diminish, and for a hot minute the regions of central and south Mesopotamia possibly saw a more collective approach to diplomacy. The discovery of clay tablets containing administrative details with city lists in the aforementioned Jemdat Nasar indicates a possible collaboration between city-states at the time for regional projects. What exactly these projects were, we will probably never know. Overall, the pre-dynastic period of Mesopotamia saw major developments in human civilization that changed the course of history. Looking into the early Uruk period, we find the first evidence of writing in a proto-cuneiform script known as Archaic Sumerian. Through the rest of the period, the script fully develops into cuneiform. This would go on to codify legal codes, aid regional administrations, and keep track of trade. We also see evidence of the first wheeled vehicles in this period, but the specifics of which have eluded me in my research. A last interesting note is that the primary way we understand and divide the pre-dynastic period is from pottery. It's unsurprising, but as culture, technology, and society in general developed, so did the styles and makes of pottery. We can tell the Ubaid period existed almost solely based on its pottery remains, and we know about Uruk's influence mainly because its artifacts have been found in abundance in the area it controlled. There is even still debate on whether the Jendat Nasar period should be considered separate from the late Uruk period, as the change in pottery and clay tablets is significant, but it may not be widespread enough. Anyways, with that slight tangent over, we will enter what is known as the Early Dynastic Period. This was a period of great development for the pre-established cities. Here we see the first emergence of a social hierarchy within Mesopotamia. As cities expanded, the core village that was at times the literal center of everything became something of a social ruling class called a household. Initially, households were generally ruled by the priesthoods of the city's patron god, but by 2800 BCE, 
the idea of kingship had become firmly established. The hierarchy goes as follows, the king on top, followed by the queen, then the priests, the military, the local administration, the artisan and merchant classes, and then the general laborers at the bottom. The cities used a top-down economy, with laborers being paid in rations by the administrators. As the period continued on, there was major cultural innovations with the introduction of luxury goods and commodities. Jewelry of rare gems, high-quality ceramics, and fine cloths all became sought out by the upper class. However, the laborers, on the other hand, saw no such benefit. They primarily found themselves working the large estates of the new household members, and their rights were practically non-existent. The growth and wealth of urban centers also saw rural farming communities depleted of manpower as more and more people moved to the cities for a better life. This time also saw the first recorded war in human history. The King of Kish led a coalition of Sumerian city-states in a war against the Elamite civilization. After achieving victory, Elam's cities were looted, and the goods were carted off back to Mesopotamia for the spoils to be split amongst the coalition. When it meant survival or wealth, the cities worked together, but otherwise, they grow in independent fashions from one another. Finally, nearing the end of this period, the king of Lagash launched massive campaigns against the other city-states and conquered the entire Sumer region. Even the great cities of Uruk and Kish couldn't withstand his armies. He then turned his eye to the Elamites and took portions of their territory. However, his empire would barely outlive him, as his successors had a hard time holding everything together, and it soon fell apart. Now, we enter the Akkadian period, with the focus being, unsurprisingly, on the Akkadian Empire. The Akkadians, located more north than the previous focus of Mesopotamian history, had developed fairly similarly to their southern neighbors. The only major difference is the language which they spoke, Akkadian, which split off from Sumerian earlier in the pre-dynastic period, and would soon come to nearly completely replace it under the new empire. There's just one issue. The city of Akkad hasn't been found yet in the modern day. There are a number of candidate sites, but the actual location has yet to be determined by modern scholars. We know it was somewhere in central Mesopotamia, but that's about it. So King Sargon of Akkad, who may or may not have built and or restored the city of Akkad, decided one day to conquer the entire known world, as you do, and raise his armies to march south. The Sumer region was actually relatively unified at the time under the king of Uruk, who had formed a small empire of his own. Sargon defeated the king and then proceeded to march in every possible direction to expand his great empire. His first targets were the poor Elamites, who at this point were just Mesopotamia's punching bag. After a successful campaign, Sargon turned north, marching along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers until he reached the Mediterranean. Once he had done that, unifying Mesopotamia, he had created the greatest empire the world had ever seen. Sargon himself would rule for a total of around 56 years before his death. His legacy would mainly be in the administration of the empire. His closest and most loyal allies became governors, and he established an empire-wide postal system and oversaw infrastructure and agricultural overhauls which benefited trade. Upon his death, his son Remush took power. Faced with the challenge of living up to his father's legacy, he undoubtedly planned for a long and difficult reign ruling the empire. His first challenge were massive revolts that took place as the cities tried to break away in the wake of Sargon's death. He eventually managed to put these down, and then went on to execute a campaign against the Elamites, bringing back wealth for the empire. However, his rule never got to come to true fruition, as Remish died nine years in. His brother, Manishtusu, was next to claim the throne. Once again, the beginning of his rule would be plagued with widespread revolts across the empire. After putting these down, Manishtusu got to raising his kingdom to new heights. Long-range trade in all directions, even possibly down to Egypt and further south, blossomed under his rule. He also participated in massive construction projects such as the beautiful Ishtar Temple. However, his rule didn't last much longer than his brother's, as he passed away ten years into his reign. Upon his death, Manishtusu's son, Naram-Sin, 
would become the fourth and greatest king of Akkad. His rule began, say it with me now, with a wave of revolts across the entire empire, which were once again put down. It is unfortunate that, despite Naram Sin's rule being the height of the empire, we know so little about it. His military campaigns most likely took him in every direction, from the Zagros Mountains to the east, north into Anatolia, and further across the Mediterranean coast. He claimed the title of King of the Four Quarters of the Universe, and some inscriptions have him placing himself in a sort of divine status alongside the gods of the Mesopotamian pantheons. Naram Sin would rule for 36 years, and with his burial, the Empire's own death loomed close. This time, when his son Shar Khali Shari rose to power, it took much more effort to pacify the rebellions across the Empire. This was coupled with the trouble of maintaining such a large territory in the near-continuous state of war with the Elamites and Amorites. A famine, possibly caused by gradual change in the climate and trade breakdowns, led to a weakening of the kingdom. So, when the Gutians struck deep into the heartland of Mesopotamia, the Akkadians were finished. The sons of Shar Kali Shari would only rule the city of Akkad itself and some surrounding areas. Then, the city disappeared altogether, never to resurface. What followed next is truly unclear. The Gutians were nomadic, most likely, and had raided some Sumerian cities before, but they had no written language and thus no records. The records we do have describe them akin to foreign overlords and barbarians who destroyed Sumerian culture and society. The accuracy of this is flimsy at best, and these records were written by Sumerian scribes long after the period. Eighteen Gutian kings in total would appear on the Sumerian king list, but the true extent of their influence is completely unknown. In fact, there is little evidence of a military occupation from the time, and the societal decline later described by scribes could very well be attributed to famine, lack of trade, and an ill-prepared governance. My advice? Take everything from this period with a heavy handful of salt. Finally, history pulled itself out of its little tumble into the Dark Ages and arrived in the Sumerian Renaissance, also known as the Third Dynasty of Ur. Ur was a port city on the Persian Gulf, which most likely began as a fishing village as far back as the Umayyad period. The city's preeminence really gets going as the king Utu Hegal refused to pay tribute to the Gutian king and rose in revolt. He won, then drowned, and literally nothing else is significant about him. Instead, his heirs were the ones that really got to work. His son, Ur-Namu, kicked off his reign with the first codified law system in known history. The 17 years of his reign were marked with a flourishing of art, technology, and urbanization across Sumeria. He also oversaw the construction of the Great Ziggurat of Ur, a massive structure that you can still visit today. In turn, his son Shulgi took everything his father was doing and cranked it up to 11. The Sumerian Renaissance was truly one for the history books. Quite literally, actually, as the Sumerian King List, a literary composition of the past historical rulers and where and when their reigns took place, was commissioned in this time. King Shulgi ruled for around 47 glorious years, but it all couldn't last. He tried to build a wall to keep the Elamites and Amorites out of the east and north, but his three heirs couldn't keep it properly manned or maintained. Elam would sack Ur in 1750 BCE, and the king was carried off as a prisoner. The city survived, but the empire did not, and so the end of the last period of early Mesopotamian history comes to a close. So there you have it, from farming towns and fishing villages to great empires, a great collapse, and a rebirth into a new golden age. The fundamental themes of history were all witnessed for the very first time in the Fertile Crescent. This is truly the history of all of humanity. So thank you for watching. My sources are in the description, and I will see you guys next time. This has been the Chronology Cast.